Yeah. Well, let's talk about that. Let's talk about how junior companies, I guess, were a lot of them, not all of them, a lot of them, but like what their executives really enrich themselves and uh, sort of the tactics that they're using. I, mean, I saw you recently, um, you recently tweeted something about, um, I think there was um, Mining Stock Daily is what I've written down, a, 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 yeah. um, a Substack blog post from 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 the guy. And, and uh, it, he, they were talking about bonuses. And that's an interesting part for me. I don't think I fully understand it. So maybe you can walk me through how bonuses normally work or how, how you think they should work and maybe through a few bad examples that on how they shouldn't work. Yeah. I mean, in that particular case, like, look, my contract allows for short-term incentive, like cash bonuses um, annually based on, um, you know, hitting certain KPIs, key performance indicators. Um, that particular one was uh, a very substantial bonus to the management when they hit a certain market cap. Right. And, and then, you know, like, I think it was $900,000 and I think it was another 1.8 million or something like that. If they hit the next sort of market cap threshold, my point there was that if you're judging by market cap, not uh, share price, like let's say I'm a $25 million market cap at a dollar share. So I got 25 million shares out 25 million bucks. Um, it's like, okay, I get, I get a uh, million dollar bonus for getting to a $50 million market cap. Well, why don't I just issue a bunch more shares? Right. <laughs> like, Boom, raise 25 million bucks. I mean, it's not always that simple, but you know what I mean? I've delivered no value to shareholders, but I've doubled my market cap and now I'm getting a massive bonus, right? So I was just pointing out the absurdity of that one where um, the, the incentives seem aligned until you actually think about the, the, the ways in which you can increase your market cap that are not, you know, don't actually add value. Um, so, you know, that that's one, but, but I think that, you know, bonus payments are reasonable. So part, part of my contract, for example, when we created the company, um, actually here, here's a question. Would it be useful for me to explain how I got every share I got? Cause I think, you know, we talk about seed shares and, and founders rounds and, and bonuses. And I could, I'm quite happy to walk you through everything I've paid for our sure, shares. Especially share based compensations. They don't. Sure always makes sense to me. There's the yep. different names to the models and stuff like that. So I, def I definitely want to talk about that. I had it on my list. Yeah. So sure. When, when we created Fireweed, um, first off, the company existed conceptually for probably six months before uh, it was actually incorporated. Um, and this was because our initial first counterparty was, was HUD Bay. And we were buying this project off them. And, and there was a hang up in the contract and it took a while to get it done. Um, but there's a lot of back and forth, a lot of due diligence, a lot of planning on our end. Um, so for like six months, I was earning nothing trying to, you know, get this done. Um, and then we finally um, got HUD Bay over the line. There was an initial payment to be made and some costs to be done like lawyers and, and et cetera, et cetera, to get this going. Um, so we seated the company um, as a, as a founder, I got 500,000 shares at one penny. So, you know, e extremely cheap. But that was kind of for the, the sweat equity and the um, intellectual capital or whatever you want to call it for having those relationships and, and building the company. And then we did a seed round, which was mostly just the founders and a few other initial people at, at 10 cents. Um, and I bought 700,000 shares then. Um, so I feel like it might have been a five cent round. Um, if there was, I didn't do much. But so I put 70 grand in at 10 cents. Is it like um, a, I'm sorry to interrupt here, but is there, cause I've seen that, that some, yeah. some companies would do a seed round of like a millionth of a penny or whatever. I don't even know if that's a number. And then they, like they bought a billion shares for nine bucks or whatever. Yeah. It is. So, so if you're listing on the TSX venture exchange, um, generally if more than 10%, I believe of the shares are, are issued below five cents, there's a problem. So they might not allow that. Right. So that 10% always goes to the founders, right? It's like, those are basically the free shares. Uh, so you kind of have to think about what's my share structure going to look like um, when I am public and listed because the venture exchange at least doesn't allow you just to say, you know, print unlimited shares. And, and this is all going to be in the, um, you know, the listing docs, right? So shareholders are going to see this and, maybe that's worth it, right? Like if, if I go to a major mining company 
and um, secure a purchase of a major asset at a really, really good price. So let, let's say I get something, I've agreed to buy something for 50 million that's worth 300 million, you know, whatever. Um, so I'm instantly creating 250 million in value. So the idea is I'm trying to capture that. And so I would issue myself a bunch of shares. Now that's an extreme an example, right? So, you know, because so you'd split the difference maybe with, with the investors to see like, okay, we're going to capture this 300. I'm going to give you some of it, but I'm going to take a bunch because I was the one that got the contract, right? Um, so creating the company, having that, that, you know, sweat equity and intellectual capital into it is worth something. The question is how much is it worth? And, and there's undoubtedly people who abuse it. Um, you know, the other thing is if, it, if when done right and, and, you know, the venture exchange is, is usually pushes or requires it, um, shares below a certain price have an escrow as well. So we had a, a three-year declining escrow on our, our seed shares. So it's not like if I issue myself a million shares at a cent or, or 0.1 cent or 0.01 cent um, that we go public and that day I can blow it out, right? You, you, you can't. It's usually 10% on day one and then 15% of it every six months after that. So by the time you get to three years, it's all it's all free trading. Um, so the the you think about the, you know, when I do a private placement and I do a four month hold on it, um, I do it at a discount to market because a four month hold is a impact, right? Like you, you could do uh, like option pricing for the parity of, of what the equivalent price would be, but a free trading share is always worth more than a, um, you know, a share on hold. So if you're on like a three year declining escrow, that impacts the, the implied value of your shares. Um, but, you know, so that's, that's the question is, do you think management is taking too much here? Um, do you think they're, um, is it a fair amount given the amount of effort they put into the company to get it going? So we ended up doing like a, uh, like the one cent found around the 10 cent round, a 25 cent round, then IPO it at 50 cents. Um, so I, I bought into each of those rounds, but, but the lion's share of my shares came in the, the one cent and 10 cent rounds. Um, but, you know, until the, and actually until the 25 cent round, we still didn't even, you know, own the property really. We still didn't have the the legal over the line or, or it was still like an LOI. It wasn't a definitive. So you're taking a big risk with that as well. Mm. Um, so there's, you have to consider that like a free or cheap share is, is, is not, there's no equivalency necessarily between two different companies mm. because sometimes I think that, you know, I, I 70 grand that was basically every bit of capital I could get my hand on that time within reason. When I bought the 10 cent rounds, you know, my wife was, six months pregnant. And I'm like, well, here's our nest egg. <laughs> you know, let's, let's put that, put that in. So it was a major risk, you know, it, um, that's different than people who are in the habit of creating these new companies, particularly when they're behind the scenes and you don't see their names, you know, so you don't see that they own 8% of the company and they got it all cheap and they're trickling it out in the market over the next three years, or, or it's done instead of an IPO through a RTO, so a private company merges into a, a shell mm-hmm. and all the shell shares are, are free trading and you don't really know who owns what. So these people are, are brokers of shells and, and um, make out like bandits there because they, they're able to get the, the, the very cheap shares and do this very advantageous deal uh, on, a, on a you know reverse takeover uh, and then trickle their shares out in the market or blow it out, whatever they want, right? So there's definitely ways to abuse. I mean, plenty of ways to abuse that. And, and it's for the untrained eye, it's very difficult to tell. And yeah. sometimes only in hindsight, can you tell, right? Like in the end, if, if management really delivered and shareholders, it was a value creation, you know, opportunity. And this company created value for shareholders. Um, then the, the management did well is, it's not like a bad thing. Right. Right, uh, right, right. I don't want to. Also, I don't want to. Like, I know sometimes you could appear as the, as the person who doesn't want other people to make money. Yeah, none of that, of course. But it's just sometimes it gets kind of weird when you see, you know, people. And, and that's also another question that I would ask is like they would say, "Oh, I own fifteen percent of the company." Yeah, I often ask how much that you pay for it because yeah. you're saying that you own fifteen percent of the company to be aligned with me. 
Yeah. But if I'm buying at a dollar and you bought at a penny, how aligned are we really? Yeah. And yeah, you and think I, that's I guess fair? Yeah, it, it, it is. Um, and because the downside risk for them is is minimal, the, the, the likelihood that they're going to be in the red on that effort viewed only as what they paid and what they exited at is, is extremely unlikely. Um, I, I think you have to consider that you can exit at any time. They cannot. Mm. Um, and also that... Um, Likely, like you know, so so my salary now is 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 quite reasonable. It's, it's less than I would what I would make on an open market, but it's a reasonable salary. But you know, for the first six months of Firewood, I made nothing. For the next six months, I made like very little, very 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 far below my my open market rate. So um, it's like, well, what's my cost? You know, how much money did you put in? It's like, well, it's also how much opportunity it cost me, right? So there's there's all honestly sometimes opportunity cost and. That's not, you know, generally doesn't account for that. So I think that's the key thing is, you know, what, what's the, are, are they aligned with you? And it's not always that they have a big position. Sometimes they pay a lot for it. Um, sometimes they don't pay much for it. I, I don't know. Is, is a billionaire who pays the same as you aligned with you versus a, a person who, um, you know, doesn't have a lot of money. Like I did when I found Fireweed who bought shares for much less than you. Like this is hugely material to me, making the company succeed. Where to a billionaire who's paying a market price for Fireweed right now, one way or another, like makes no difference to their life, right? That's exactly so, what I ask as well. When they tell me that I'm like, okay, but if you lose your money, like what degree is that? Like, are you just going to feel a little bit bad? Are you yeah. going to end up sleeping on the couch or are you en- going to end up sleeping in the park? Yeah. And so they, they get to pick one of those. And uh, I think that with most people, it's, you know, the first thing um, yeah. that I've, that I've interviewed. So. Um, yeah. And, you know, in our industry, like if, if, if fireweed was a, a spectacular failure, let's assume it's not my fault um, that it's just because projects are risky, you know, think things happen that they're outside management's control or, maybe there's some new technology that replaces zinc and galvanizing and the market craters and our projects worthless. Right. I don't know. Right. So, so um, has that cost me a lot of money? No, but it cost me nearly a decade and, you know, in your career in management, you've only got so many shots, right? So, you know, as you get later in your career, you know, if you don't, if you haven't had a major win, you know, it starts to become a problem because, you know, you're, it's not like in our industry, we're we've got good pension plans or anything like the, the success of the company is your pension plan. That's your retirement plan is being involved in at least one or two successes. Right. So um, th- there's a risk just, you know, if I had stayed in investment banking, I want to be making a lot more cash than I am now, but I'd be, you know, saving every year. Like it's a, it's a very de-risk life compared to what I'm doing. Right. So that's, that's the, the challenge and opportunity is that I can get this massive outsized return, but if I don't, um, that's a you know better part of a decade where I'm coming out of it the, the other side with what I went in at, right? You know, and that much closer. It's my 45th birthday on on Sunday, um, so I'm coming just that much closer to retirement with with still no ability to retire. So that's that's the challenge, and, and recognizing management teams that are hungry makes a big difference. You know, I, I think a lot of people, there's kind of a, a, you know, a rule of thumb in the industry, like, you know, back people who have been successful before. This is a reasonably good thing because um, people who have been successful for get access to better projects because people are like, hey, Brandon, you've been successful. I've got this project. I want to bring it to you because you can deliver. Hmm. So because I also because I'm successful and because people bring me a good project, I get a lower cost of capital which helps means I get to raise more money. I get more shots at it. Right. So, so if we need a certain amount of, we're, maybe we're doing a discovery story. If I can raise more money than, than some other guy, I have a better chance of making a discovery because I can do more geophysics first and I can put more drill holes in to try to find it. Right. Mm-hmm. Even if we both have the exact same project, I have a better chance of succeeding because I got more money at a lower cost. Right. So absolutely. People who are successful, it's easier for them to succeed again. I, I honestly think it has less to do with the fact that they're better and more to do with the fact that they get access to better projects and then and access to cheaper capital. 
the flip side is though, a lot of guys who've been successful or people who've been successful, um, if they've been really successful, it, it becomes, I want to stay in the game. I don't want to retire. I enjoy this. I'm going to launch this new company. And it's like a hobby, right? You know, they're, they're running this company and, and it's got a legitimate shot, but they're, it's not like they're, it's not like they care about the paycheck. They may not even pay themselves, right? It's, it's just a hobby company, right? So that's kind of the thing to watch out for when you've got these industry veterans who are um, massively successful is that they'll roll the dice on a lot of stuff that's kind of bullshit. But it, for them, it's like, oh, you know, it sounds interesting. I don't have to worry about the risk of it blowing up because like um, I've, I, my future is secured. So that's the other kind of flip side is that, that yeah, people who are successful uh, have been successful. It's easier to repeat, but that you also have to question how hungry they are, are they to repeat, right? That the, the hunger decreases and they might start to take outsized risks. I, I think, you know, the challenge with someone like me, but where my entire personal wealth is almost tired up, tied up in fireweed is you might be legitimately concerned that I'm de-risking when my shareholders shouldn't want me to de-risk. Right. So maybe I'm trying to diversify my projects. Maybe I'm doing something that de-risks fireweed when you're actually trying to get me to take more risk. Cause you've got a portfolio of companies. You're looking for that outsized return for outside rewards. You need outside risk. Right. So, um, Someone who who it's too important to them might be de-risking. Someone who it's not important at all might be going the other way, going going too risky, right? Um, so you have to understand that everyone kind of works to their incentives, and that it's not as simple as, "Hey, this guy's got success, so therefore I'm going to back him." Or this person um, is a noob, so you know, and gave themselves all these free shares, so I don't I don't trust them, right? Um, so it's it's complicated for for every rule. Uh, there's like exceptions to it. Mm. That I look at, I don't, I have no idea if what you're saying to me here is true or not. I'm yet to figure this out as I go, but, and I don't mean to blow any smoke, but I like how you're sort of giving me the two sides of the story. Cause you would have people who say, ah, you know, let them make money. Don't mind the seed shares. And then you have people who'd say, oh, seed shares. If you have that, just don't touch the company. And, and none of those really seem reasonable and what you're telling me just seems reasonable to me and i also like that you're bringing up salary i i wrote that down because i also wanted to ask you what you think is a go- good sort of r- rule of thumb because what, what we were talking about is uh, you know aside the salary you know you get a salary yeah. on top of the bonus and all that but what's a go- good rule of thumb for a, a paycheck like do, do i make a ratio between the company's market cap or the company's drill expenses, or how do I know if an insider is getting paid too much, which might be, I guess, a sign for a lifestyle company? Yeah, you know, it's, I guess it's, you look at the person's experience and what they're delivering. I'm, I'm obviously, if, if you've got like a true nano cap, like say a $3 million company, it's a problem if the person's drawing a $300,000 salary, right? Like that's, that's 10% of the company's worth, right? But once you're kind of out of that nano cap territory, do you want good people or not? Right. Like, um, particularly right now, like it's crazy wage inflation right now. It, it is, it is out of control. Like I, I could say like, you know, I, I don't want to pay my geologist this much. It's like, well, great. I'm losing all my best geologists. Right. So, um, that's, you want, you want to attract good people. And, and it's, if it's an established company who needs a new CEO, for example, well, how do you attract that, that CEO? Because, if they're established company, there's no more seed shares on offer, right? That's that's done and dusted. So you can offer them a healthy option package, but they're not getting those free shares. So there has to be some salary and, and incentives with that. And so it's like, look, the, the simple rule is like, there's absolutely people out there who who um, draw the salary, don't deliver for it. Um, and who, as we say, mine investors, they don't mind, you know, rock. But, um, and there's lifestyle companies, you know, I, I was involved with a company that had uh, vended a project to a company that was that was a lifestyle company, and um, management was very entrenched. And it was very difficult to get rid of them. They give themselves very healthy salaries for not doing a lot. What's what's as interesting is what the salary they collect is is how many salaries are they collecting, because it's not uncommon for management to be involved with multiple companies. 
partic particularly CFOs. Now, now I'm not trying to disparage CFOs because you know a company often doesn't a small junior doesn't need a dedicated CFO. So you've got you'll pay Bob the CFO uh, sixty grand a year, which is way less than his full time rate. Way 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 less, right? But what you don't understand is that Bob's doing that for you know twelve companies. <laughs> Right, because all he's got to do is he's got that crunch. He's got a bunch of people, and he's got that crunch time for for the quarterlies uh, and and the annual financial statements. You know, so that that's one that's quite often abused. But there's also people that are CEO of multiple companies, and that's okay if the you know a, a small exploration company with a limited field season often doesn't need someone full time. You know, there's too many companies. Where is it five? Would that shock you? Uh, well, as a CEO, yeah, you don't have time for that. Um, and I think if often, like, like when Fireweed first started, it was in my contract that it was expected to be 75% of my time. So I was meant to have time on the side. So my salary at the time, which was 120 Canadian, uh, like 10 grand a month, was meant to reflect that that, that was like 75% of my time. So, so I had time to consult on the side. And, and part of what happened was we realized I had, I, I was, it was like a hundred and 20% of my time. It was not, there was not 75%. So, so the salary the year after had to be adjusted because I thought I was going to be able to earn some money on the side. Um, but I was not right. So, um, if, but if I had had that time, you know, it wouldn't have been unreasonable for me to, you know, run something out the corner of your desk, as they say, you know, there's lots of companies that, um, maybe they have a small resource. It's not enough to go to mine independently. You're, you're trying to find a deal. Um, there's not doing any active exploration. Um, someone has to be CEO. Someone has to be appointed the CEO of that company, but it's, it's a pretty low time commitment, right? So yeah, you, you know, maybe, I mean, I can't now, I, I, just, I got time for nothing, but other junior mining CEOs might actually have time to run that off the side of their desk. It's just, are, are they collecting a reasonable, is the total amount of compensation reasonable? Um, and that's, Sometimes it's hard because they might also be consulting some other companies. You may never see them mentioned by name in the financials. Mm. So it's it's hard to know that, yeah, this, this guy's paying himself 250000 to be CEO of this company. And it's a reasonable looking company and, and, and it's involved and that's not bad, right? Um, but how many other consulting gigs does he have? Or So that that's, that's the challenge. And, and sometimes you'll never know. So people, but this is also where being at it, PDAC or whatever, you get that intel because you find mm -hmm. out, oh, like so and so, yeah, you know, he's consulting these three other companies too, right? Like, because that that's like that's where it starts to get really dubious, where you have things like uh, people who are affiliated, and it's like, hey, Bob and Jim and Tom, um, you're CEO of your companies and I'm CEO of my company, but we're all going to pay each other as consultants out of our companies as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I just want to talk about that because that, that's a very weird concept in general to me. Sort of, because it, I cannot see it in the income statements. Like, I, yeah, I know some of these companies would like also like rent an office space from their daughter, whatever's best no, friend. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they whatever whatever it takes to not be a related would, party transaction, right? But, but otherwise very close. Right. Exactly. And, but they, they, would, they wouldn't mention it by name because sometimes you would have like consulting fees or what did I see one time? I saw something like a rent of a logo for like a million bucks a year. Yeah. And you, you try and do some drilling, you don't find anything. I had the chance of, the, I had the, um, the luck, I guess, of having access to some people in the industry. So I would ask them, hey, this company was that. And then you sort of figure out, okay, the company that this company is renting the logo from, that's the company's owned by... I don't know, his far uncle. There's just sort yeah. of some weird dealings within the within those financials that you cannot see by just reading them. Well, you, you have to look at the totality of the expenses, right? Because if if there's a lot into consulting fees or whatever, and you're like, what you know, that, that's where again, there's always two sides to it. So so some companies absolutely there should be a high degree of expense on the project versus you know GNA. And, and consulting and stuff like that. Um, other companies, sometimes actually, it's it, 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 there actually is a lot of work to do on the consulting and and the behind the scenes stuff. And there's less to do on the project, so it's not like a perfect rule of thumb. But 
If you understand where the project's at in its life cycle, then you understand that they have their permits that could be drilling and there's not like any other stuff to be doing. Why is so much getting spent on other stuff, right? And, and marketing is a great way that people sink so much into marketing and in, you know, with their buddies' companies or um, maybe it's another buddy's company that they just don't understand that they're not going to get results on it. And so many contracts being done through check swaps. Um, if you know what a check swap is? No, I yeah. prefer you explain that. Yeah. Okay. So, so let, let's say I'm doing a $500,000 financing I'm a small company. So this is meant to pay, you know, keep, keep the lights on and, and um, you know, do a little bit of geophysics and, and uh, some marketing. Right. But what you don't know is that, the two hundred fifty thousand I'm spending on marketing, um, I got that investment from the marketing company. So what what happens is it's a swap of checks. So uh, they give me a two hundred fifty thousand dollar check, I give them a two hundred fifty thousand dollar check. So now they've got the the tax burden of that two hundred fifty thousand income, um, but it's presumably they can blow up the shares for more than that, right? So let's just say their corporate tax rate is is twenty five percent. Certainly they're gonna the stock's not gonna be down seventy five percent by the time they blow it out, right? So um, these, these check swaps are extremely common. And I mean, and I've done it not, you know, I know who my counterparties are, are on these things and, and we've never done any big ones, but I, I've actually been in a company where the company was really struggling and, um, I was check swapping my own salary because I was like, I, I'm working my ass off here. You can't afford to pay me. So I either I'm quitting or at least I get paid in shares with a check swap or something like that. Right. So, um, that's the that's the challenge is like generally the companies are doing a lot of check swaps and it's very it's not like it's disclosed in the financials that's a problem mm -hmm. right that, that that's generally a bad sign that that the actual net out of a private placement is very low they've done a million dollar private placement but actually most of that was check swaps so they're actually only netting you know 300 grand in the bank that, that that's a problem um, so if i because i i would ask a company how much are you spending in marketing but that you can see, but should I be asking it um, how you're spending them? Like, should I be asking it? Should, should I be asking that of a company? Yeah. Like, is that a fair question? Yeah. Look, uh, how much are you spending on marketing um, and where and how do you know whether it's been successful or not? Right. right. So, so the big problem is, you know, if I do a digital ad campaign, if I have an online um, retailer, I can track from click to site visit all the way through to purchase and revenue, Right. So extremely easy for me to know that I marketed through this channel. I spent this much per click, and then I had a conversion rate of this per click to purchase for this total revenue. I spent 30 grand in marketing. I got 300 grand in revenue, you know, which, of which the profit was, was 60 grand. So net spent 30 grand, got, got 30, you know, got 30 grand profit out of it. So you're like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So oversimplifying, but you know, that's a case of like, I know exactly how well my marketing is working. Um, junior mining, I can't trace who buys my stock. I, I can see page views. Uh, I can see retention time. I, I can see all sorts of metrics for engagement, um, but I don't know if it's causing buying. Uh, and if I'm doing multiple marketing streams at once, which you generally are doing, um, and there's buying, it's like, well, which one's causing it? Are any of them causing it? Or is it just someone who, who learned about us somewhere else? Um, so it's very hard to kind of tease out which one, you know, how, how it's successful. But, you know, we're pretty serious about tracking as, as many metrics as we can, certainly from our digital advertising, to, to try to get some sense of each channel we market through what the engagement level is. Um, and, and if we just don't see a high engagement level uh, on a particular channel, we, we kill it. Um, and, and I think that also there's a reality in, in a market like right now, pushing hard on um, uh, you, you know, digital marketing when the market's not receptive is, is probably not a good idea. So, so that's, it's, it's a legitimate question to ask to a company is like, okay, so how do you market? And um, how, how do you decide what's working and what's not? Well, um, I saw, I looked into your um, income statements and I saw that you're, 
you're spending about, I mean, last year you were, you spent something in a bank, you like 300, call it 350 in between thousand yeah. yeah. dollars on IR services and marketing. Yeah. And then out of your total expenses, 7 million ish, if yeah. I'm not mistaken. So it get yeah. like, it, is that an accept, acceptable ratio? Is it, can it be higher? Sh- should it be higher? And how, how do you look at that ratio there? Uh, I mean, we, it was a tough year last year. Like we didn't, you know, I think we started the year at a buck 20 and finished the year at, I don't know, a lot less than that. <laughs> so, uh, but would marketing have fixed that is the question. Um, we're going to be spending more this year. Certainly early on in the year, it felt like there was a much more receptive market. Um, but there's no, I, I, you know, again, it depends when gold's hot, you know, gold companies, it's a great idea to be marketing. When, when gold's hot, a zinc company can spend the exact same buy the exact same marketing program that a gold company does mm. and get 10% of the results. Right. So that's the challenge when, when your market is more niche or out of favor, it's harder to get that traction. And, and there's no, there's no lever we can push to like, great, let's just get more, pull this lever and, and get more buying. It just doesn't work like that. Right. So, mm. um, we're very careful and, and we've, we've got a new marketing person now who, like I said, is a, he came to PIDAC, like he's a journalist, so he's not a mining person. So he has a lot of digital awareness and has, has brought a new level of kind of metrics to understanding, okay, how valuable is this? And so, um, you know, we've been integrating things like landing pages and, and drip campaigns and stuff like that. And um, all these things help, but there's no, there's no single one that magically works. Um, you know, I think that a, a busy company um, that's doing a lot of exploration, um, 10% of your cost of marketing is not unreasonable. We're a public company, right? You know, the, yes, it's, it's ridiculous when a company has nothing good to say, but they're spending a ton on marketing. But it's also kind of tragic when a company has something good to say and nobody's hearing it, right? That's also a problem. You know, I... I, I want to create liquidity because liquidity is good for my shareholders, but it also convinces new shareholders to come in because big shareholders, if you're a liquid are scared and they're not going to buy. Right. So that becomes sort of a vicious circle of like, if you're not liquid, you get less liquidity. Right. And, and then you sort of, as we say, trade by appointment because you become so liquid. So, um, you know, I have to, there's value in having liquidity. So is there a, perfect is, is there some perfect rule of thumb no but i think it's fair to ask companies particularly those who are spending a lot um are you getting value particularly if there's one massive you know because some the exact rules are are a little unclear you know what's what's a service provider what versus what company doing investor relations for you but a lot of it gets disclosed um and if it's disclosed and it's a big contract, it's, it's fair to say like, oh, you spent $500,000 in that campaign, like $500,000. Like it's different if you're spending 50,000 on 10 different service providers who are providing, you know, something over the course of the year, but $500,000, some of these big campaigns, these big digital pushes, et cetera, $500,000 is, is they'll issue them. They'll spend $500,000 on them and issue them options. Right. And it's like, better get some value for that. Right. And, um, it's, it's fair to ask management about it. Right. Right. But so I, I wrote down that salary over 10% could be problematic, but marketing over 10% could be okay. Yet though, both of those are dependent. Like you can yeah. have a salary over 10%, but the person's doing a whole lot more. They're discovering discovery after discovery or whatever. And, and in the yeah. meantime, they're, they're drilling and they have cash flow or whatever it might be, you know, they're doing a lot for their money. So it's it's not like a fixed rule, but I guess that's where. And I'm not asking for a fixed rule because this is not. I, I figured this out rather early actually in my journey that accounting because I'm I'm an accountant. This, my background's yeah. in accountancy. Almost everything is fixed, and yeah. that's not the thing with investing. Like you have a, a, an exception upon an exception upon an exception, and so you sort of have to start getting a a, a feeling for it. It seems. But what I would use this for is to sort of draw my attention to it. So if I see a salary over 10%, 
I'm just going to look into it. I'm not going to discard a company necessarily for it, yeah. but I'm just going to look a little bit more in depth into it. If I do see yeah. marketing costs over 10%, I'm going to look into it. Like if I saw, for example, that you were spending, let's say a million out of the 7 million on marketing, yeah, I would be getting a weird feeling. I would be wanting to know more. I wouldn't necessarily discard you for it, but. So yeah. I and and I think that there's far fewer red flags out there than there are kind of yellow flags, you know, saying slow. Right. You know what I mean? And, and if, if there's one yellow flag, but the rest looks good, eh, you know, maybe inquire about it, but that, but every company is going to have yellow flags be, by circumstance or whatever, because they don't always mean that it's bad. It, it just means that this, this could mean something bad and I should probably look into this. Um, but when there's a whole bunch of those yellow flags, like this company is just littered with them. May, maybe you can just stop your due diligence there. Right. And that's also where management like myself needs to understand that, if I'm doing something that's legit, but I recognize there might be a negative interpretation of it, I have to understand that going in. And I have to understand that that starts happening a lot, um, that people may be scared off my company without understanding the whole circumstances, right? So either I, I have to be not do that thing, um, or I have to have my communication on point, on mm -hmm. point, right? To make sure people understand why you're doing something. Um, so I, I certainly think is that if you're new to the industry, you know, look, it's cool. Come up with these rules of thumb, you know, some of the things I suggested, I don't know whether they're accurate. Or not. I'm sure other people on Twitter and some of that have better ideas of what rules of thumb are, but um, don't consider them red flags. Just start as yellow flags and, and, you know, score a company based on it and be like, okay, I'm still interested, but I've got these concerns. Hmm. Who do I ask about them? Management, other investors, et cetera. Right. Right. And a lot of it, I've noticed that by interviewing a couple of companies, depends on the way that answer your question way more than it depends on what they say in their question. Like if they're being around mm -hmm. the bush or being direct with you and stuff like that. Yeah. And so it's, it's something that I did learn in business school uh, was just a class that I was getting within accountancy was we, we were getting marketing. And the first thing that they explained to us was the difference between sales and marketing yeah. and marketing is they, they explained it to us as um, let me translate that as a, um, as a gut feeling. Yeah, that's the word. That's an, that's yeah. an English expression, right? Gut feeling. Yeah. yeah. So it's yeah. a gut feeling. So marketing is the gut feeling that uh, like that the, 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 um, the public has towards you. Sales is getting the people to buy something. And then marketing yeah. is what is the gut feeling that they have? Like when they think of your company, do they think of you like, ooh, it may, may be a good project, but I don't feel like dealing with this person. Or yeah. are they thinking, okay, that's, that's great. Let's see what this guy's got going on. So it's yeah. the difference. And I think that companies do, the companies that I'm noticing at least, some of my customers as well, and I've been critical to them as well, is that they, they put a lot more efforts into sales, not so much effort, efforts into marketing. Because I don't think anybody expects a junior to be a perfect company. I don't expect the junior to be a perfect company. I do expect to be perfectly informed. So if, yeah. you, if you're putting out news releases that are like putting super small intervals in the in the headline grade and, and stuff yeah. like in, in the in the title grade and stuff like that, it's sort of where it, it sort of annoys me. You don't follow up onto it to, to explain to me why you had to put it in there. Maybe it's a very important intercept or something that I don't understand as a non-geologist. Yeah. But I want to be informed in one way or another. Maybe you put out uh, an email or you do an interview or just that sort of way you're building up that gut feeling. That's how yeah. I feel. Is that fair? Is that is that yeah 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 and I think that um in, in junior money comes, one of the things to understand is that um, people get wear a lot of hats. Um, like we're 15 to 20 people, depending on how many people you, you count. And um, uh, we don't have any IT support. So uh, the former programmer of the company is the IT support, me, all right, the CEO. So we're trying, to, we're trying to find a relationship there to take over, but it's, it's tough for a small company to have a dedicated person. So it's an external thing, but often you know, we didn't have a dedicated marketing person for quite a while. So that fell on other people to try to figure that out. Um, so in a small company, certain tasks are necessarily going to non-experts. So you do kind of have to give juniors a, a bit of slack on some things like, oh, like your, uh, your website, like, I don't like the colors. It's like, well, we don't have a designer in-house, right? Like we went to this one designer, it's all the only person that we knew or, or whatever. So um, yeah, we get a little bit of slack there, but Ultimately, you know, building that brand, we're also a very personality driven industry because the company's small, people tend to fixate on the CEO or, or maybe the chairman who's had some success or something like that. Right. So, um, 
understanding. This, this is why I think, you know, I like being on Twitter, um, maybe on Twitter a little bit too much, but um, it's built a brand for me. Um, not everyone likes that brand, but at least I'm being authentic. People understand who I am. And I think that is, is good. And so, um, but that's different than the, the sales, as you, as you say, which is, you know, the direct sales pitch to, to, to investors. Um, you know, so that's, I think that's a good start though, is, is understanding that people need to understand who you are and what you're about and what you're trying to accomplish before they're even receptive to the sales pitch. Exactly. That's very well said, which is, which makes me think that marketing should come before the sales. And it, it, sometimes in some of the, some of the ways that companies are using to market, it feels like they're trying to stuff as many, as much stock down people's throat as they can yeah. while the, the, the excitement is going on. And then I guess that might, might also be the reason why they, they, you know, they put us, they, they put the, the, the sector under the same umbrella as, as biotech and yeah. other micro tiny gaps. So that's a good point. Yeah. This, it's getting really interesting. Now, I was actually looking at my clock in the upper corner of my screen and we, we've been, it's almost, you know, we've been at it almost uh, an hour and a half. So I, I yeah. see you've got to go. Is there something that you wanted to talk about today, but I failed to bring up? Now, obviously, I wanted to talk about zinc, by the way. But- well, let's do it. Let's do it because I've got I've got another half an hour more for my next meeting. So um, I, well, I'm happy if, if you, I most I'm, I'm, I'm a CEO of have a, you back on for a full zinc interview, and we do like an hour or whatever on zinc because yeah, I like. Yeah, why don't we? You know, and we just picked up a major tungsten project as well, um, okay. which we, we announced that last week, last Tuesday, um, which. Uh, I think some people would consider a little bit out of left field. There's a whole logic there, and and I'm happy to talk about zinc and critical minerals broadly, and, and what's going to happen with global restocking, supply nationalism, um, yeah. and, and what that's going to mean for metals investment. And that that is an hour and a half to itself, I'm sure. So perhaps uh, I think this you know th- this has been pretty good in terms of a primer on what this industry is like, and and that you know I think the takeaway is that things aren't as simple as it seems. That there's there's very few red flags, a lot of yellow flags, um, things to look out for. Um, listen carefully, be diversified. <laughs> you know that's that's the main takes away. Mm. Is it fair what I said sort of to you? Is that like I I I yeah I noticed that you for example were you were you were really the yellow flag in in the discussion. Like you wouldn't say only good things about the sector, but you wouldn't only say bad things about it either. No. So is it fair like when, when you're sort of figuring out who to follow, because there's more and more Finfluencers popping up yeah. who, who would share their own opinion, they say, but they, they know that they influence people's minds, right? And so is it fair to say that if you see somebody being way too green flaggish, like only saying good things, that's probably someone someone to mostly ignore. But if you also see someone being only negative, that's also maybe someone to ignore. Or would you say follow both and listen to none? How do you see that? Yeah, um, I think you need to follow them all. I think if someone is relentlessly promotional, then they're, they're just always talking their book. That doesn't mean their book is bad. You know, I can think of a few people on Twitter who who are always talking their book, but they are also incredibly good at due diligence. Right. So maybe they're okay to talk about. They don't talk about stocks they don't like because, you know, you consider there to be 2000 juniors between the ASX, TSX, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You're not going to talk about all of them. And you're certainly not going to spend a time, a lot of time researching a junior that you immediately are not interested in. So people talk their books because this is what we're excited about. Um, and people who are constantly critical as well. I think it's useful, but I find there's a lot of people who are critical of companies that are peers to the ones that they are invested in, mm. or, or there's some personal beef or something like that, right? So um, every project has has problems, um, and every project has something good about it generally. So follow a lot of people, learn who has the most measured takes, and and um, slowly accumulate. You know, trim some follows and add some new ones. Um, slowly accumulate people who you think are providing good advice. Mm. Mm. Yeah, it's a, again another sort of. It's not a fixed thing. Like you cannot put this into an algorithm, and the algorithm tells you who to follow, or you put this in, into an algorithm. And the algorithm tells you which company is shady and which isn't. 
Yeah. We might eventually get there with AI or whatever, but that'd be interesting. Yeah. yeah Brandon, this has been great. Thank you for investing so much time in me. Yeah, no problem. We'll hopefully uh, do it again soon. Yep, absolutely. I'm going to...